On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave her he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rivals used to provoke her severely, to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. <sighs> Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, yet the priest, was sitting at the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will it give to your servant a male child? Then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Thirteen. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pains. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to share together in faith and life and reflect upon your word. Now may the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts be an offering to you. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I do have a cartoon for today. I think you can see it okay. Yep. So Dennis the Menace is bringing in a box full of whatever. And he says, you don't have to worry about stepping on them, Mom. They keep moving around. <laughs> So have you ever been anxious? Have you ever been anxious 
about what your kid dragged in? Have you ever been anxious about your or your loved one's health and safety? Have you ever been anxious about the state of the world? Most of us have. I remember a time when I was younger, uh, still a kid, when I came home from school and, and no, no one was home, home like I expected them to be. And I waited and I waited and no one called. I heard nothing. It seemed like hours and hours. And I got really worried about and anxious. What had happened to them? Where was everybody? And finally, they all came home and everything was fine. But you know what? I realized why my parents had told me, call us if you're going to be late. I think both of our scriptures today, the ones that, the one I read and the one in 1 Samuel, deal with our very natural human anxiety. For Hannah, it was anxiety over her fertility and the relationships with her family. For the disciples, it was anxiety about the future. The stories suggest some ways to deal faithfully with our anxiety. So what did Hannah do? Hannah was dealing with domestic, everyday anxiety. Because she seemed to be barren, the other women in her household treated her with disdain and abuse. She lived in a society that highly valued fertility in women, and that women were pretty much worthless without children. So Hannah had reason to be anxious, even though her husband tried to reassure her, you know, that, that he loved her anyway or whatever. I have a feeling she was still anxious how long that would really last. Her anxiety and sadness led to her not being able to eat. So what did Hannah do? She dealt with her anxiety by going to the local shrine and praying to God. She didn't just pray, she poured out her soul her emotion, her heart to God. Her prayers were soundless, but clearly a lament and supplication to God for a child. She was even willing to bargain with God. If she had a child, she would give the child back to God. So if you're anxious, just pray, right? Well, the story is a little more complicated. Certainly prayer is a good idea. Taking our anxieties and concerns to God in prayer is a time-honored way to respond to the troubles in our lives. In the prayer Jesus taught us includes, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, please, God, take care of this hurting world and give us this day our daily bread. Please help us have the basics we need for life. Prayer connects us with our creator who knows all our needs and wants to provide for them. As Jesus reminds us, God cares for the birds of the air and the flowers in the field. How much more will God care for you? In Matthew 6, 28 to 32. And then Jesus adds in verse 33, but strive first for the kingdom of God. And all these things will be given to you as well. Prayer isn't about saying the right words and pulling the right strings to get what we want or need. It's about our relationship with God, putting God first in our lives. This is what Hannah does. 
She not only prayed to God fervently to meet her need, she also offers to God back the very son she is asking for. She put God first. The second thing I notice about Hannah is that she is not alone. She may have thought that she was alone, but Eli was there at the shrine and he is curious about this woman. And as David read so well, you know, a little bit disdainful, what is she doing here? She seems to be acting very strangely. Her lips moving and no sound coming out. So at first he judges her and confronts her. But she courageously tells him that she is pouring out her soul before the Lord. Now, it's interesting to me that Eli doesn't invade her privacy to ask her what the petition is about. But he offers his word of encouragement. He says, go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And Hannah replies, let your servant find favor in your sight. Then verse 18 explains that when the women went to her quarters, she ate and drank with her husband and her countenance was no longer sad. She was reassured by the words and presence of Eli the priest. Sometimes we need others to help us through our anxiety. Maybe it's so bad that you need a trusted counselor, but I think most of us need a supportive community of prayer. Our prayers, concerns shared with others can help us find assurance and trust. The supportive community of faith can help us put our anxieties in a wider perspective. Eli's addition to her prayer gave Hannah comfort and peace. So two ways we can faithfully deal with our anxiety are to pray to God and to look for a supportive faith community to join us in prayer. If you're not sure how to pray, remember you can just talk to God like Hannah did, or you can use a prayer like the Lord's Prayer. If you're not sure where to find a supportive prayer community, we have, as I said before, several small groups in this church that can do that for you, or, and we'll be putting the word out soon about what all of those are. And also today, we will have opportunities for prayer and anointing for healing during our worship service. Like Hannah, we can bring our burdens to God and find healing for our anxiety. Now, the passage we read from Mark today, maybe I should have just skipped it, David. I could just stop the sermon here. Oh, well, too bad. From Mark today, looks at anxiety from a little bit different angle. Jesus re responding to the disciples' anxiety about the future of their world, you know, their whole world, their institutions, their structures. Jesus had just declared that one day the temple would fall down. This amazing, beautiful temple would be gone. The center of the nation's religious life would be in ruins. What a terrible thought. Most early readers of Mark would know that this indeed did happen. In 70 AD, the Roman armies came and destroyed the temple and Jerusalem itself was in ruins. It's natural to be anxious when we see and imagine the institutions and the structures we have always relied upon to be finite. Imagine pointing out to Jesus what a beautiful building we have here at Everett and have his reply being, well, during the next great earthquake, it's all going to fall down. 
We know intellectually that every country and institution made by human hands has a limited lifespan. Once our country didn't exist. And once again, someday, it will not again, at least in the form as we know it. A theologian, Margie Suhaki, was once asked, what is the tradition of the Christian church? And her answer was, change. <laughs> Our tradition is change. Yet change, especially change that we do not initiate or control, produces what? Anxiety. <laughs> and sometimes also fear. So what to do? Of course, we pray and find a supportive fellowship. But Jesus adds some interesting things in this passage. He says, first of all, beware of being led astray in times of anxiety and change. Later, when talking about coming persecutions, he exhorts them to endure to the end. Jesus seems to be saying that in a time of great change and anxiety, hang on to your faith. Keep true to the truth and love that you have experienced in Christ and the community of faith. Don't be led astray. When we are anxious, we often look for easy answers or people to make us feel secure. Jesus says, be careful of this. Discerning such things is not always easy. Otherwise, why do we need the warning? You know? Later in chapter 13, Jesus points out that no one knows the timing of such things about the future. No one knows, only God alone. Our job is is not to try to discern the timing, but to discern the way to stay faithful to loving God and neighbor in the meantime. Staying true to following Jesus no matter what. So one way to deal with our anxiety about the future is to focus on the present and what we can do with our lives right now. I find when I'm feeling anxious and when I know I need, then I need to know, and then I know I need to focus on what matters. You know, what really matters to me? What really matters to the world? For example, we don't know when the great earthquake will be or if it will damage our church. But we do know that right now we have an opportunity to share a space with our community that can help others and tell the story of Jesus. We can do things that matter today. We don't know all the solutions to the problem of homelessness in our community, but we do, can do what we do, what we can do with the power we have today to feed the hungry and offer love and care to everyone who comes through our doors. Yesterday at Judy's uh, memorial service, Clay Austin um, shared his story of how Judy trusted him as a homeless person and, and how we treated him with respect and dignity when he was homeless and what a difference that made in his life where he's no longer homeless. And, has a whole lot of other things going on. We can make a difference today. We do, may not have any families with children right now worshiping with us, but we can right now create spaces like our, our little child area back there we wanna do that would welcome people of all ages. Also in this passage, Jesus says, don't be alarmed by the news of wars and famines and other calamities. <laughs> Can you imagine not being alarmed by such things? 
but he says they are birth pangs, birth pangs. In other words, the things that seem so disruptive can be seen as the beginnings of newness, even new life. Certainly in the passage, these birth pangs are about the coming of a new age when Jesus returns again. But I think the birth pangs can also be about how we discover new possibilities of God in any disruption. Of course, we don't like wars and famines and pandemics that produce human suffering. Yet if we think of these terrible happenings as birth pangs, could we be less afraid and more able to work for life-giving outcomes? Could it be that Jesus is telling us to look for the signs of life and rebirth in the midst of suffering? I have another picture I want to share with you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> a very strange, kind of a strange example of this, at least I think, on my wall in my home office, and I want to show it to you. It's a picture from National Geographic of the hill at Bamiyan in Afghanistan. Now, you may recall that um, several years ago, the Taliban destroyed the giant Buddha that had been sculpted in those hills for thousands of years. Now the grotto that held the Buddha is empty, as you can see from the picture. See? It is both a picture of a great tragedy of war, but I also see it through the lens of birth pangs. Now that the grotto is empty, this can now be a sacred space for all religious faiths. It can stand as a reminder of what intolerance and hatred can do, but it can also remind us that sacred spaces, the sacred of life, can never be overcome. Eventually, Hannah did experience the birth pangs and brought into this world Samuel, who became one of the great prophets and leaders of Israel because she gave him back to God. Her prayers were answered and she faithfully lived out her trust in God. As we face anxious times and experience anxiety or fear in our lives, we have her example of prayer and faithfulness. We also have Jesus' challenge and call to live faithfully now, no matter what. Jesus promised that in the power of the Holy Spirit, he would always be with us. Amen. Thank you.